Well, hello. Um, thank you all for joining, even though I'm sure there is a delicious lunch out there. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, my name is Laura Shifter, <clears throat> and I am a senior fellow leading This is Planet Ed with the Aspen Institute. Um, and I'm really excited that you all are going to be here to help us discuss how education to, can take action on climate change and really help empower the rising generation to lead a sustainable, resilient, and equitable future. Um, I'm actually very thrilled to be moderating this conversation today on International Women's Day with three amazing women sitting here. Um, I should say I have the privilege of working with Kira, Maya, and Nana beyond this conference, and I am just constantly amazed by their commitment to advocacy, their commitment to getting work done on issues of climate change, on you know really pushing the country forward, and I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation with them today. I'm in awe of them constantly. Um, so just to let you know, we have Kira here, who's a public policy representative for Total Energies, Maya Green, who is at Stanford University and formerly um, with Student Voice, the advocacy organization, and Nana Agarwal Hardin, who's a student at Yale and uh, formerly also at the Sunrise Movement. Um, I have the opportunity to work with them all on our K-12 climate action work. And they have just been amazing, engaged participants of that work. And so it is great to be here with you all. Um, you know, I always start off with this question when we're talking about issues of climate change. Climate change is really a personal issue for all of us um, and it's really a critical reminder you know we're talking about technical solutions we're talking about science etc but the motivating factors behind this are really are really personal in terms of what drives us to continue to work on these issues um, i had my own climate moment a un report came out i was looking at my three daughters and thinking about the life that they would have in 10 years down the road and just realizing, I worked in education policy for a long time, realizing we could have the best education system in the world and it would not matter if the impacts of climate change took hold for them. Um, so recognizing this personal issue and it's the personal issues that often connect us all on this, I'd love for you all to each share a little bit about what motivates you uh, in taking action on climate change. Um, so Kira, love to start with you if you want to share and then we'll go down the row here. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank you everybody for being here today. Very happy to be involved in this conversation. Um, so for me personally, I was born and raised in Ketchikan, Alaska, which is a small island community in southern southeast Alaska. It's a fishing town. It's in the middle of the Tongass National Forest. Um, and it's really shaped who I am. Um, so growing up there, your way of life is very outdoorsy. Um, and that means you're hiking every single weekend uh, and weekdays if you can fit it in. You're fishing with your family. Um, and you're really just living your life in communion with nature. And so naturally, that means that you notice when things start to change. And so for me, that was in high school. Um, my family is lucky to live on the water, and I was remember, remember vividly being on our porch and looking out, and the ocean was this beautiful, bright Caribbean blue, um, which is very much not the steel gray that you typically get in cold Alaska. And I remember being in awe of it. It was so beautiful. It was so warm out. <laughs> what an incredible thing. And then a couple weeks later, uh, we started having a mass death of the fish um, because this algal bloom has sucked all the oxygen out of the water. And for me, uh, we love, like I said, we love fishing that sustains us. It's, it's part of our way of life. And so realizing that that was in danger based on naturally occurring phenomena like climate change that has obviously got significant human impact um, was a, a real wake up call for me. Thanks, Kira. And Maya? Yeah. Um, kind of Hopping off of Kira's Caribbean blue comment, um, my dad's family is from Barbados, um, and so I would we'd go and visit every couple of years, reconnect with family there, um, and I have this vivid memory of being quite young um, on a boat uh, with my uncle, just chatting, um, and he kind of started it's the first time I remember learning about climate change. Like I have a vivid memory of not knowing what it was before, 
having this conversation and then knowing after. Um, and I think I was really lucky to be introduced in that way, like in, in a safe place with an adult I trusted, um, because I guess contrary to proper or popular belief that, that kids can't handle um, learning about climate change, that it's too scary or too overwhelming, I immediately started thinking about solutions. I remember him telling me about buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, comparing the ocean in a perspective, terrible climate future to Coca-Cola. And immediately I'm starting to think about, oh, well, what if cars had a plant in the engine instead of an engine? You know, what if cars were um, putting out oxygen instead of carbon dioxide? Um, and so I, I think having that early um, intro introduction to climate, it's the kind of thing, it's kind of like when you learn a new word and then you just start seeing it everywhere. Um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and, and once I had learned about climate change, all of a sudden I, I was seeing it everywhere. I was seeing it in um, the floods downtown every time it rained. I was seeing it in the hurricanes that only came every couple of years when I was quite young and then started coming every year like clockwork. Um, and so I, I think it it really is the kind of thing where, where once you're aware of it, um, you, 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 it totally, you see how it's shaping your life. You see how it's shaping your community. And, and once I could see it, you can't unsee it. So that's what motivates me to work on this. Yeah. Um, so I, I love how all of our responses to this question are really anchored in the places we're from. Um, my, mom's parents live in a small rural community in East Tennessee, sort of nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, my dad's parents live in a small remote community in northern India, right under the border with Nepal. And um, in 2016, so I was in eighth grade, uh, there was a big fire, the Gatlinburg fire, um, in the forest that surrounds my grandparents' home in Tennessee. And there was, you know, there was a span of a few hours where we thought it was going to burn down this place where I've spent Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter, like every year that I can remember. And it was really scary. It was exacerbated by drought. And it has taken years and years for that community to rebuild um, from the damage, largely because of rural poverty. And then the next year, 2017, there was really bad flooding during the monsoon season where my dad's parents live. Our house there is on a hill, so we were really lucky, and it was like the waters receded right in time, but it was just another one of those sort of close call experiences, and again, really hard for that community to recover, again, because of poverty and governmental disinvestment. And then in 2018, um, I also was looking at a UN report, maybe the same UN report Probably. that Laura <laughs> <laughs> mentioned, um, and was it was talked about, you know, natural disaster, and it was talking about all these things that I had just seen play out um, in these two real, like, anchors of my, my family. And just, yeah, was like, wow, this is so incredibly urgent. I feel so unprepared to tackle this, you know, issue. Um, and, and at the same time, it's playing out right now. Like, I'm watching it happen in real time. Um, and I think before that, I had always thought of climate change as something that was sort of for, for future generations. And that was really what brought home to me that it was a present issue. Um, yeah. So I, I want to pick up on that because you all were in, uh, you know, middle school, high school, you know, in 2010 range to 2020-ish all where public opinion about climate change was changing extremely rapidly, largely because of the climate impacts that we're seeing outside of our window. And you all just described, you know, rural Tennessee and India seeing it, uh, Charleston seeing it, seeing it in Alaska. And uh, being in school, that could be a place to help you process what's going on in the world around you. And I, I've, you know, I know that we've had this conversation, but reflecting on whether education had the chance to catch up with This Is Planet Ed, we recently did a survey in partnership with um, Capita and Siena College, and it found 82% of respondents agreed that children will be essential in fighting climate change and that we need to provide them with the knowledge and skills to build a sustainable future. But a Washington Post poll showed in, you know, 2019 that only 14% of teens actually feel like they're learning a lot about this in school. Um, so recognizing that gap, I'd love for you to reflect on your own personal experiences of how climate change was being taught in your own schooling experiences um, 
and especially compared to what you were talking about in terms of what you were seeing around you. Nana, you want to start with that and then we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, often dubbed the most educated city in America. It's a big source of pride for us. And I say that because even with that reputation in my really high quality, really well-resourced public schools in elementary and middle school, um, I have maybe one recollection of briefly mentioning the greenhouse gas effect in a science class. It was never a subject in classes outside of science. And every single piece of information that we got about climate change was accompanied by the caveat that scientists are unsure whether this is really happening or there is a lot of discord about how reliable this data is. Um, and so and then when I got to high school, um, I was going to school in the next town over, um, which was actually a lower income and predominantly black community. Um, but my high school drew from our whole county. Uh, it had a great international baccalaureate program. It was still a public high school. Um, a lot of the teachers were really young. We had great relationships with them. And even then, um, I have a few memories of being in science classes and having teachers sort of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Like, I believe climate change is real, but I couldn't say that to the whole class, you know, because it's too controversial. So I just, I mean, predominantly it's memories of like very sporadic mentions of it with a lot of doubt and um, disclaimers built in um, and always, always confined to, you know, the science classroom, never social studies, never history, never um, any other discipline. So, yeah. No, I, I think I had a, a largely similar experience um, growing up in, in public schools in Charleston. Um, yeah, I, I can't recall it before high school. Um, and even then, yeah, very, very relegated to biology, to, you know, an environmental science class that I explicitly had to seek out um, and very disconnected from the real climate impacts that I was seeing in, in my own community, you know really talking about it as this kind of global, scientific, abstract phenomenon, um, and then not tying it to, like, you know, why are we out of school around Labor Day for a week every year when that's not a scheduled holiday? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I was really feeling that the classroom was kind of a vacuum from the real world, that the real world was something I had to set aside when I went into school and then any climate action that I felt motivated to take, I had to explicitly kind of seek out and build for myself um, in my extracurricular time. Yeah, and just to briefly add, I went to public school in Alaska, um, so another public school kid, um, a few years older than Nina and Maya though. Um, I'm 24 and uh, for my experience, also confined exclusively to science, um, we mostly discussed it in terms of the ozone layer. Um, there was no discussion of the greenhouse effect. That seemed to be a lot more settled because we had done something about it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, apprehension around scaring children, um, arming them with a problem and not providing them with a solution, um, I, I, even if it's not taken in a political direction. People don't want their kids to feel hopeless. Yeah, so it's interesting that you bring up to that point about the ozone layer. There was just a, an Education Week survey done that showed that even though teens are more likely than adults to believe in climate change, agree that it's human caused, there seem to be a lot of misconceptions about what the actual causes are of climate change, where the same percent of teens will say it's related to actually the ozone layer. Um, and a uh, slightly fewer number actually recognize the greenhouse fa gas, gas effect as having any sort of consequences related to climate change. You all are working on issues related to climate change now or advancing sustainability. How do you think people's misconceptions um, impact us in actually taking work on this issue uh, at the scale that we need across, across society too? Kiri, you want to start with that one? Sure. I just I think there's a lot of noise. Um, you have a lot of folks who are well intentioned, maybe, who are trying to tackle this issue. But since there's no curricula really uh, on on climate generally, um, you have a lot of people freelancing, and um, that can be very helpful. That can also be a little bit harmful. Um, obviously, appreciate attempts to talk about this issue, but it's also important we get the facts right. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I'll, I'll add, I think that that noise, I mean, on so many issues can be really paralyzing. Um, if, if one kind of clear, consistent message isn't rising out of it, it's, it's easy to 
get overstimulated with all the different directions and okay, well, if there isn't consensus, you know, like I, I just won't think about this. Um, and I, I think we all know, and are, I hope we're in agreement that like this, this really isn't an issue where we can afford to wait. Like the science is clear. Um, and so I think figuring out ways to communicate that, um, to young people who have no, uh, lack of, of passion around the subject and, and really having schools meet them where they already are um, and equipping them with the skills, the knowledge to, to really move forward solutions, I think um, is I, the clear path forward to me. Yeah, and I would just add, not only are there misconceptions about the science, but I think there are also misconceptions about the solutions when they are even discussed, right? Like I think a lot of people come out of school and are under the impression that all they can really do about the climate crisis is turn off the faucet when they brush their teeth, turn off the light when they leave a room, bike to work more often if that's accessible to them, which for many, many, many communities it's not. Um, you know, these sort of very individual solutions um, that I think often, like sometimes they can feel very productive, often they can also feel very isolating. And in the face of such a massive issue that is so scary, like that isolation can be really harmful, especially in young people. So I guess I would also add that like, somehow we have to come up with a way to talk about solutions that are bigger than just one person. Um, because that misconception that, you know, all you can do is, is recycle your plastic bottle um, is actively impeding action from young people. And what do you all think the role um, of social media is in terms of helping build knowledge about climate change? I know that we've seen, you know, we see silence to some degree in schools. Um, we've seen silence between parents and young people and young people having to go find the information about climate themselves. You three are examples of having to do a lot of that and rely on people in your life to go ask these questions. Um, uh, I think it's about 44% of young people go to social media to find answers on climate change. And, and that could be both a good or bad thing. How do you all think about the role of social media in climate education? Maya, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about my little sister who uh, is six and a half years younger than me. Um, so she's 14, about to turn 15. Um, and even like the way we engage with social media with just that, you know, almost seven year age gap is, is so different. I, I talked, I opened with my climate moment being with a, a conversation with my uncle. Her climate moment was watching YouTube videos, you know, as a, as a kid. And so I think um, it, it, social media can be this really powerful tool. Um, it can be this great kind of open forum of, of stories. Um, and I'm certainly super grateful for the communities that I was able to find in high school online um, on, on, of people who cared about um, education and climate and, and just provided outlets that I, I wasn't finding in my school. I think social media can be great at, at meeting that need. Um, but I think it, it really needs to be supplemented with uh, a way to, to sort through the noise, a way to... Um, identify misinformation and and know um, how to how to fact check how to um, kind of evaluate the stories you're hearing online um, and and I think with that paired with that that social media it, it can continue to be a, a great outlet for young people kind of looking to get involved with this issue yeah, I can br briefly add, I think what's really fantastic about social media is that it can help bridge that gap I was just talking about between the, the individual and the systemic. Like, I see so many people develop a consciousness about what can be done uh, beyond those individual solutions because of what they see on social media. And I think, you know, there's nothing that can replace the feeling of a candid conversation with a peer or a teacher or a parent or an administrator, a trusted adult, like Maya was saying, um, about these issues, both in terms of quieting climate anxiety and in terms of leading to community-based work towards community-based solutions. So like, I think the role of social media is super important in bridging any knowledge gaps that have arisen because of the inadequacy of the climate curriculum in schools. And I also think that it's no substitute for... Um, real conversations in your community. 
So I think on that point, um, you know, we talked about the the bigness of the issue, the feelings of isolation that can come from processing it. And a lot of young people are feeling this too. Um, you know, 75% uh, of young people have said that climate change makes them feel sad, anxious, um, you know, depressed. Young people are in school and if they're having all these feelings, what do you all think that schools need to be doing to actually help young people process and address these feelings? And Maya, I'd love to start with you and, and go from there. Yeah, I, I think uh, just initially I'll, I'll say, like, I sympathize with those respondents. Um, <laughs> climate also makes me feel sad and anxious and, and, and did when I was growing up when I was in um, k the K-12 through system. Um, I think thinking about uh, the ways that schools have to equip people um, to process or address climate change, like, it isn't just oh, here's the skills, the knowledge you need for green jobs. Um, here's the science, you know, we want to make sure you understand the greenhouse effect. It's also how can schools equip students to, to work through these issues and, and these emotions in productive ways because, you know, climate is an existential threat. Like, it, it's normal to feel sad and anxious about it. And I, I don't think we should pretend that it's not. Um, but I think oftentimes, you know, conversations about, social emotional learning and you know, agency and empowerment in the school building and, and climate can be very siloed when, when they all really work together. Um, and I think um, Nina was talking about like the isolation that can come with climate anxiety, the powerlessness. And I think, you know, schools at their best, like at their core are really this like built in community that you have as you're growing up. Like when I think about my K through 12 experience and, and the people that really shaped me, the adults that shaped me, um, oftentimes it goes back to the school building, you know, that's like you're, you're spending basically the first 18 years of your life in community with these people. Um, and community can be such a bomb to the, this kind of intense climate anxiety. Um, but if you're in community, in a community that's largely silent on this issue, that's not acknowledging when people are are processing losing their homes from fire and flood, and and um, then I think that that community can be one that that breeds isolation rather than connection, rather than collective action. And so I I think schools need to really think in their climate curriculum how they can acknowledge the rational feelings that students are feeling about this thing that is really going to change our lives, um, but then also equip them to not be paralyzed by those feelings, but rather use them to drive action. Kira, do you want to add to that? Sure, yeah. I think schools have an incredible power of convening, having just young people all in the same spot, um, talking to each other. Um, I think there's also a role to play in understanding that climate is not just a physical phenomenon that is happening. It's something that's going to reshape our future, our economy, our way of life, our world. And showing students where they can fit in, whether that's in advocacy or showing how every job can be a climate job in the future, I think is a very important thing to be instructing kids on. So can you expand on that a little bit too? Like every job is going to be a climate job and ultimately we need to make sure that we're preparing people for those jobs, you know? Uh, people think about clean jobs and they think solar, wind, you know, jobs in the clean energy part of it. How, all are, how are you all thinking about every job as a climate job and how do you think schools need to shift to kind of refocus on that? Certainly. And as full disclosure, I work for an offshore wind developer, so I also <laughs> believe that offshore wind jobs are a key component of this. Um, but I think part of it is the recognition that when we talk about clean energy economy and clean energy energy jobs and the climate economy generally, um, that doesn't just mean folks who work on solar farms and construct wind farms and do maintenance on things like that. There's a whole host of jobs that are associated with that, whether that be caring for the ecosystem that these projects are sited in or um, working on transmission issues, interconnection issues, um, things like manning the boats that construct offshore wind farms. Um, there's a climate angle to every job and it goes way beyond your standard engineering degree. It's, it's part of everything now. To working on policy for offshore wind jobs, Certainly. right? <laughs> um, so Nana and Maya, you all aren't uh, in jobs yet, but you all are thinking about what you're going to do next. Um, 
Naina, can you tell us a little bit, and then Maya will go to you, in terms of how you're thinking about how climate change is going to impact the future work that you do? Yeah. I, first of all, talk about climate anxiety. When I was deciding where to go to college, and now that I'm in college, like, looking at where I might want to be based and where I might want to work after graduation, the first thing I think about is, like, is this a place that would be, that would feel safe to call home 10 or 20 years from now? Which is a really intense line of thought to have as a young person, right? It's like, oh, I would love to live in, you know, on an island or, you know, in a place that's really vulnerable to sea level rise, but I don't feel safe there. So I'm maybe not going to do that. Um, and so that's one thing. It's just like literally the, what it would feel like to call a place home and whether that would feel safe. Um, but beyond that, in terms of like the actual, you know, workforce, I think, um, I really agree with what Kira said, like every job is a climate job. And I think I'm maybe interested in going to law school, um, maybe interested in the nonprofit sector, but like no matter where I am, I know that the lens I'll be bringing to my work is a lens of climate resilience and adaptation. Um, and yeah, even if it's not like a traditionally environmental job, even if I'm not an environmental lawyer, there's no way to sidestep those issues. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I feel like even your own trajectory, Laura, is, is evidence of the fact that, you know, kind of whatever you go to school in, whatever career you feel pretty rooted in, there's a way to make it intersect with climate because, you know, it's our home, like ho home touches everything. Um, I, I think that's something I've thought a lot about. I'm an urban studies major. So I, I think my, thinking about my experience growing up in Charleston, you see the ways that, that race, that class, that um, climate are, are all interconnected um, and in, in the places that we live and you really can't take one issue apart from another. And so I'm not quite sure what I want to do after school yet, but I, I, I know that, um, you know, that there really is no way to remove climate from the considerations that I'm making about my life 10, 20 years down the line, the considerations that I'm making about my community, you know, in a, in a place that's really vulnerable to, to sea level rise, thinking about what would I even be able to live at home um, in 10 and 20 years is, is really scary. So, um, yeah, I, I think every job is a climate job. Every job has to be a climate job. So um, I know that you all have had different roles in being, you know, learning about this issue and then being placed in positions where you've taken your work to advocacy, advocacy when you're in higher ed, um, advocacy on education issues in general in high school. Um, students are, can be powerful advocates and it has to be done really effectively to bring students into the conversation. I, Love to hear some thoughts around how to do that effectively. Uh, I feel like oftentimes we bring young people into the conversation and it's always great to have a young person in the group, especially on an issue like climate. But there's a lot of things that really need to be done to do that well. And, um, you know, I know, Maya, you focused a lot on that on student with student voice. Can you share with us and, you know, have you all touch on it, too? What do you think it means to actually include young people in the dialogue effectively um, on these issues? Yeah, well, I, I think it really takes um, yielding some decision-making power um, to young people and, and really recognizing young people's expertise, not bringing them in conversations to, to be kind of props or, or gestures towards like representing that perspective, but meaningfully integrating it into um, whatever kind of decision-making process is occurring. Um, I think young people are clearly already doing this work. Like when you, when you think about bringing young people into climate conversations or bringing young people into conversations about the intersection of climate and education, um, like these are already conversations being had um, amongst ourselves, um, whether that's organizing climate strikes or advocating for nuanced policy solutions, like young people are clearly already doing the work. Um, and so I think uh, w what adults really need to do is just kind of recognize, recognize, acknowledge that work, um, ask how can we be partners to you rather than you maybe just being in service of, of initiative we've decided we're already doing. Um, and so I, I think, um, yeah, that, that kind of, humility, um, recognizing young people's lived experience as, as, as its own expertise, you know, 
people being key and observers of, of how climate is playing out, how climate change is playing out in their own communities. Um, I, I, I think young people are, are, are ready and willing to kind of contribute to, to climate solutions and climate solutions in education. Any added points, Dana? I mean, just a very brief thing. Uh, so I used to run training programs for middle and high school students who wanted to learn about climate solutions and weren't learning about them in schools. And so we would invite students from high schools across the country, but we would never invite them alone. We would always invite them with at least one partner, often two or three other people from their school. Um, and I think I've often felt like I've often been the youngest person in the room I'm in by, you know, many, many years. And I've often felt a pressure to represent the, like the entire demographic of the youth. Um, and I've also felt like I don't, you know, have anyone to sort of bounce ideas off of or share reflections with or just process with after, um, after those experiences. And so I think, yeah, I think in inviting more than one young person or inviting young people in ways that are going to let them go back to their community and work with other people in their community to enact solutions is a really great way to show a meaningful commitment to hearing youth voices instead of putting it all on one exceptional individual. Invite representatives of a community that they can then work together and use what they've learned. I agree completely with what's already been said. Um, and just to add... I think a huge part of it is inviting young people as an equal participant. Um, so it's sometimes you get invited to conversations and you're just there um, and they, you, you're talked over and it's not a great experience for anyone. Um, but if young people are invited as equal full participants, uh, you have a much better conversation. And the, the last thing I'll say on this is just, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday and they made the observation that they were so new to this field that they were new to climate and my response is everyone's new to climate this is a very young field mm -hmm. and we all have unique perspective to bring to this dialogue excellent so we'll take some questions from this group and I know I have a couple more um, Michelle do you have the mic <coughs> do we have a mic excellent uh, so we have a question down here I think Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, my name is Francis Coster. Francis Coster. Um, I run an organization called the Pollution Detectives, which loan students equipment to inspect their schools. One out of five Americans either works or attends in a K-12 through school. One out of five. And they are among the most climate-changing buildings in the country. Leaking refrigerant gases from schools is 1,000 to 7,000 times worse than CO2. And we can teach students how to find those leaks, record it on their cell phone, and show it to the school board. That empowers the kids. We send them in and have them measure the tire pressure. What's the biggest issue, budget issue, other than salaries for a school system? Energy costs and it's wasted all over the place, causing huge climate change tests. We have the kids test the school bus tire pressure and find out they could reduce energy consumption by 10%. There's a whole host of ways that I've been trying to get built into curricula, and I can't do it by myself. So if there's anybody in the audience that wants to help me work, build a community, a curricula that would be adoptable all across the country. Only two states have any climate change curricula. So I'd love to say, Kira, on that note, um, we had the opportunity to uh, visit a net zero elementary school. I don't know if you were at the plenary this morning, but John, se former education secretary, John King, talked about this visit to this school. Do you have any reflections about visiting um, Alice Westfleet Elementary, uh, net zero elementary school in Arlington, Virginia? Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible experience. Um, the environment that you're learning in is extremely important. Just having a safe, comfortable place where you can learn is is a huge part of your education. And many of our schools try to provide that, um, but are severely under-resourced. And so visiting a school that was uh, very thoughtfully designed to incorporate that was, was very interesting. Yeah, and there were zero fossil fuels used to run the building. And I know John said that when it was built, it didn't cost more to build. And it was because 
what the um, Arlington folks said, they were smart about how they did it. So thinking about the positioning of the school building to maximize solar rooftop, making sure that the roofs were visible to students so that they could see the solar on their rooftop and graph it in math class, um, that they were all these key elements built into this too. So there is just so much opportunity to get students engaged in project-based learning on these issues too. Any additional thoughts on that? I mean, just on the on the topic of solar powered schools, I would love to share that my high school, uh, someone, an anonymous donor donated for us to have solar panels on the roof of our school. And so for the first two years that I was going to school there, um, students knew that it was a partially solar powered school and students were actually also able to do like projects in their science classes if they chose um, around like, you know, measuring how the solar panels were functioning um, and studying those technologies that we were operating in our school building. And then we moved buildings uh, as I entered my junior year and there simply weren't the funds to relocate the solar installation. And I remember a series of really difficult conversations with um, our administration where we basically were just like, yeah, we're just going to have to like say goodbye to this thing that's been a part of our school's culture. And um, that school building that we were in is, is located further towards um, like the more impoverished neighborhoods of the town that we were based in and it's currently sitting empty and that solar installation isn't serving anybody simply because there weren't the resources um, from the district to like relocate it or make it useful to a different group of students and I think that's just like one example of how like there can be such good intentions and you can even get such a good start on um yeah, these, these, these things we're talking about, about making schools more energy efficient, like infrastructurally, and then it can fall apart without prioritizing, especially public education in our state governance. And one of the big potentials that's out there is the Inflation Reduction Act, and hopefully have that be used by schools all across the country. Um, and it's one of the things that we've been working on a lot is making sure schools know that that opportunity is available to them, because that's not an education bill tax credits are not something they know how to use or leverage, and there's just a lot of potential there to make sure things don't fall through the cracks or at least get that seed investment going. Any other thoughts on uh, Anya? Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, Maya, you talked about your uncle being able to broach the topic of climate change in a way that got you thinking about solutions, and you also talked about um, how schools need to take care of the emotional valence of this topic, right? And and integrate with their mental health and wellness. I'd love to hear everyone on the panel reflect a little bit further about how adults can engage in these conversations with the young people they care about in a way that is cognizant of the stress that it comes burdened with. I, I mean, I, I can start. I think it's obviously so important. Um, I think there's this idea that the mental health of students will be, I guess, kind of further strained by adults broaching the convent, by adults broaching this conversation with them. But really, I, I would say it's also not good for students for the conversation just not to be raised at all. I think silence isn't an option. So it's not a matter of like, okay, like can can how can we do these conver conversations in a way that isn't damaging it's like the, the mere existence of climate change is damaging so so how can we kind of work through what might be you know a, a hard conversation what are certainly hard emotions um i think knowing how to be like resilient through those and, and resiliency then coming in in more ways than one um is is really key um and i think as a student I, I really appreciated when I felt like adults were, you know, kind of approaching me as like an equal participant in these like very real challenges. Um, I think no kid, I, I, I oftentimes in, in class when I'm, I'm reading things that um, in academia that, that feel like um, I, I don't quite know who they're writing it for. I, I think about the experience of being a kid and like looking up, you know, being shorter, looking up at adults and like the experience of having a conversation happen over your head um, when you really just want to be a participant in it um, and, and how frustrating that can be, uh, especially 
with something like climate that where young people are already seeing the ways that it's impacting their lives now and will continue to impact, you know, the rest of our lives. And so I think not having the conversation is not an option. And, and that can be a good, hopefully starting place for adults in, in kind of reflecting on how can we engage young people as rational actors who have like observations and experiences and, and emotions about this issue, just like we do. Um, or you want to add? Sure. Yeah, I think honesty in education is the only way to empower students. We can't have folks say out of one side of their mouth, this is too scary for them, and out of the other side of their mouth saying, this is the generation that gets to fix it. Um, <laughs> how are we going to do that if we don't know fully what the problem is? Um, that's all I have to say on that. I would add an invitation to work on it together. I think there's a few ends of the spectrum. There's the like, this is too scary for you. Don't worry your pretty little head about it. We'll figure it out. Um, or like, you'll deal with it when you're an adult. And then there's the like, the youth are going to save us and it's all on you. And like, we've already messed it up so bad. Like, good luck with that, you know? Um, and I think some kind of middle ground between those that acknowledges like, children and young people as rational actors who have good ideas about solutions and also says you don't have to do it alone I want to help let's you know go to a meeting for a community organizing initiative together and see what that's all about or let's watch this YouTube video about you know using renewable energy in our home together um, but yeah I think those like intergenerational partnerships are really important and comforting. And I think it's really important for adults and parents to do kind of what you all are talking about in, in recognizing that it's okay for us to not know. And that there's an important step, too, to say, like, we are doing this together in a partnership. We don't have to have all the answers, but we're going to work with you to find all the solutions that we need um, and do that together. I think Maya was the first person that, that really drilled that home to me. And I was like, oh, my God, Maya, yes, you're right. Um, yeah. Patty. Yeah, um, this has been such an inspiring panel. Thank you, all of you. It's been wonderful. Um, my question is, as you, oh, sorry, I'm, um, I'm Patty Miller um, with the Clinton Foundation. Um, as you all do more work and study and research and advocacy um, in the field of, of climate um, and climate advocacy, who has inspired you um, or what has inspired you? Are there people or initiatives or efforts or movements that have really inspired you as you think about your work? I mean, certainly. Um, I'm a very hands-on type of person. So for me, the most empowering thing has been working for a clean energy developer directly. I was in nonprofit advocacy. I was on, on the Hill for a while, but actually working directly on building these projects that I know are going to come online um, has been the most empowering thing for me. Uh, I, yeah, I draw a lot of inspiration still, and especially as like a 16, 17 year old, drew a lot of inspiration from the broad strokes vision of the Green New Deal um, and the Sunrise Movement, who I worked with really extensively during my, my high school years. And I think the reason for that is that that vision um, completely flipped everything that I had known to associate climate change with on its head. And suddenly it was not just um, something that was going to cost like untold lives and um, mess up our economy and, you know, really profoundly affect the places I call home, it was also an opportunity to fix a lot of what's broken in our society, even beyond um, like environment and climate issues, and an opportunity to create millions of high paying jobs, an opportunity to tackle questions of racial justice and economic justice head on, and that vision of the climate crisis as an opportunity to really rethink the foundations of our society has undergirded everything I've done since then. Um, and then specifically with Sunrise, I worked on building out like middle and high school programming, as I said, um, also worked on like planning the climate strikes. And I think just working with a lot of young people who felt the same way was also really inspiring. So, yeah. Yeah, no, um, I, I follow the, the Sunrise Charleston chapter still and, and keep up to date with what they're up to um, while I'm at school in California. And I think like, I, I would say like the young people in my own community who are like kind of quietly in non-flashy ways doing the work um, are real inspirations to me. Um, my little sister who I mentioned earlier, like it, it's funny because I, I think 
uh, oftentimes when adults thinking about climate change are like, oh, well, these young people in my life, you know, really showed me, motivated me to care or, or showed me that this was a real issue that I couldn't neglect. And I, I'm young myself, obviously, but I think having this much younger sister who even like in early elementary school was really, really anxious about climate um, and like taking her to protests with me, um, you know, painting signs with her um, really, I think, showed me uh, the importance of, of framing this issue to young people as something that is solvable, that is something that we can work on together. Um, and and really, I think, motivates me to keep figuring out ways to work climate into whatever I do in the future. And I'm going to go ahead and answer this question, too, for myself, if that's OK, um, because these three have inspired me a lot. A lot of the people I think th the thing that is amazing is about working on this issue is the people really care. And the commitment to working on this issue, I think, is unbelievable. And I will say one direct inspiration point for me was hearing Maya tell her story to our commission a while ago um, and talking about that car running on plants. And then when I had the dialogue with my kids, they ended up talking about solutions, too. And my five-year-old at the time built with magnetiles a boat that ran on wind power, and she's, like, pushing it through. My other daughter created a car that was a carbon capture car, and also had robotic arms in it that could give the kids snacks whenever they needed anything. So um, I think the idea of like really having these conversations and talking about solutions is just so critical. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Ellen Bowen. I'm actually a Miami Beach resident, so I am really seeing ground zero, the rising seas and the storms and the flooding. Um, I'm starting to work with the local school district here to try and come up with some solutions that the students can be involved in as a group. Um, and so I wouldn't mind hearing from the panelists or from anyone some of the ideas that they've come up with. Um, what we're looking at first is food waste. Um, and whether it's the cafeteria or the snacks or things of those those items that end up in the garbage end up in the landfills and then decompose, producing methane gas. So whether it's the panel or anyone else, I wouldn't mind hearing some ideas on what I could then present to the school board as something that the schools could be involved in on a regular basis. Thank you. So one thing, and then I'll let you all answer too, and Nana, I know you have a lot to say on this. Um, uh, with This Is Planet Ed, if you go to thisisplaneted.org, we have something called a menu of solutions, which just outlines various solutions that schools can take. And it includes examples of school districts that are doing it, so you can see where it's being implemented in other schools, too. So that's one very quick resource. Nana, I know that um, Sunrise has been doing some work recently, too. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, Sunrise just launched a campaign called the Green New Deal for Schools. Um, it's building off of a lot of work that I did in high school, and there are five demands um, that students who are receiving training are going to take to their school boards, and these are students from all over the country. The plan is to train about 450 by the end of the summer. Um, so it's safe, clean buildings, um, free and healthy lunch, um, green job pathways, climate disaster plans, and climate curriculum. Those are the five like broad strokes things that students are going to be bringing to their school boards and then it's up to those students in partnership with policy experts um, to decide like what does climate curriculum need to look like in our district or what can we do to our building what is our building already doing um, what climate disasters are we vulnerable to and what plans do we need to make in those emergency events um, so uh, you can learn more about this campaign if you just like go to the sunrise movements website um, pretty soon there will be a link to sponsor a student um, who's going through training there's going to be like a summer camp this summer uh, like a sleepaway camp think like ropes course and climbing wall and like cafeteria food um, but then instead of like arts and crafts hour or maybe in addition to arts and crafts hour um, you're going to get training on like you know retrofitting your school building and how to campaign for that with your school board um, so yeah, I'd highly recommend that. And and I think, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if there are students from Miami who are engaged in the program yet, but it could be a really great thing for some students from this area to plug into, if not. Um, and yeah, that's what young people are sort of calling for right now. Maya and Kira, anything else? I have one more thing if you all don't. 
Okay. The other big thing I would say is getting Miami-Dade to use the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which will provide resources to do all this stuff that we're talking about, you know, tax credits for solar energy, as well as grants that will be available for electric school buses. Um, all of that can be an opportunity, and there's funding out there. So young people could be powerful advocates in saying we should use these funds because especially with the tax credits, any school that's eligible gets them. It's not like grants of the you know days where you got to compete. The money's going to be there for 10 years, and either we use it or we don't. So I would just encourage the students to realize that opportunity and use them too. Um, we'll go here, and then or okay. there's – Somebody's got the mic back there? Right here. Great. Hi, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Butori. I am the founder of Plastic Fisherman. And uh, what we do is uh, we teach uh, families and kids about marine plastic pollution and the problems with that through art and creativity. So um, I was young one day. Uh, <laughs> in 1992, when we had the very first uh, Echo in Rio, uh, I was there. And I remember you know, getting uh, this big awareness about what was happening around the world, which I didn't know at that time. And I remember like parents going, like, it's on you. You know, you're the young one. You're gonna change the future. It's like, thank you, thank you. I was, you know, I was stuck in a car with you smoking with me all the time, <laughs> and now I am, you know, having to solve the f for the problems. But anyway, at that time, we were very limited in terms of exposure, right? We had like news about our city, our town, maybe about our country, but we didn't know about what's happening in Indonesia, or like you know, in China, or like in Alaska. And today, there's this infodemic, right? Like every day, you are bombarded on social media with all that information. And what I keep hearing from you know young people, especially like really really young ones, is this idea of paralysis. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. They feel like whatever they do, even if it's picking up the trash, it's too small. They have to basically win a Nobel Prize for it to matter, you know. So I would love to hear from you guys. You know, what are your thoughts on that, and how do you motivate people, young people, your age and younger, to uh, take action and you know and really do something to change? Yeah, and I think. Um, this builds a little bit on that question of like the individual versus collective action. Because how do we feel? How do we help people feel like they're having impact? Um, anyone want to jump in? I mean, I think a lot of it is just localize, localize, localize. Tell the stories that are around you that sound familiar, that people understand, and that they know. It is very easy to get overwhelmed with all of the bad things in the world, um, climate and beyond. Um, but telling those local stories, I think, makes it personal and real for the people around you. Yeah, I, I think like super transparently, like that that paralysis was something I was feeling a lot. Um, especially like as I as I graduated high school, I I graduated in twenty twenty. A lot was going on in twenty twenty, <laughs> clearly. Um, and it, it felt like you know kind of structural problem on structural problem, kind of compounding on top of each other. How how do you you know? And I, I was trying to pick my freshman year classes. It's like it, it felt I felt a real disconnect with what I could accomplish as an individual um, and what I kind of saw that that needed to be done um, on on a global level. But I, I would like really second what um, Kira said. And I think like really being grounded um, in in my community, in like the people around me who also cared um, was really, really helped me kind of like work through that fog of like nothing I do will ever be enough. Um, because even it, even if, you know, maybe like the best thing I can do on like a national level is like vote, I don't know. Um, the it, it really, it still matters what happens to my neighbor like tomorrow and tomorrow's flood, you know? And so, and maybe I can't do something about like these huge policy things or the way the economy is structured, who has power, um, and, and what are their interests. Um, but I, I can do something about like the people around me. I can do something about like the people who live down the street from me or in my school building, say. Um, and so I think um, really kind of reframing to think about, okay, what can I do? Um, how can I show up for the people I care about, for the places I care about, um, really helped me navigate um, through that paralysis and I think doing something like cleaning up plastic marine waste like in your community is like a great example of that 
Yeah, I ha I have vivid memories of um of feeling that paralysis as a high school student and somehow finding my way to these like meetings of local community organizers. We would be in like, you know, kind of like a grungy coffee shop or like a just like a local public space and there was this environment of like kind of scheming and collectively like putting our heads together to think about what we could do in our community and that felt totally distinct from a lot of what I was inundated with on social media um, and so much more concrete. And so, you know, I think both are important, but I think finding, like pursuing and pursuing and pursuing and eventually finding that group of people where you live um, that's going to be like your co-conspirators is so crucial for moving through that paralysis. Yeah. So I'm going to take one, I'm going to give the last question here. Um, and I'm going to take a page out of Catherine Murdoch's book because I thought she did a, had a great ending question the other day. Um, you know, we've been talking about really empowering young people with the knowledge and skills to lead a sustainable future. If we get this right, like if we do get this right, if you can't envision it, you can't build towards it. So 10 years down the road, if we get this right, what would it look like for young people today in terms of how they're supported? Um, or 10 years from now, how they're supported. Yeah. Understanding that all jobs are climate jobs. Everybody seeing themselves fitting into the world that we're trying to build. Everybody understanding that they have an important role to play. Yeah, I, I think um, young people feeling like they have agency in their schools um, to really address this issue now. Like, adequately preparing for the future, but also not like a... You, you can only work on this in the future kind of thing, but like really engaging young people who care about climate as um, partners in their own school buildings um, and, and feeling like young people have um, communities to fall back on and that they aren't navigating this alone. Yeah, I'll just repeat those five like student led demands, right? It's like safe and clean buildings, free and healthy lunch green job pathways, climate disaster plans, and climate curriculum. And all of those things, no matter what zip code you live in, no matter what the color of your skin is, no matter what your parents do for a living, like all of those things accessible to anybody who's in a public school anywhere in the country. And I think if we can achieve that, then our schools can be centers of resilience and sources of strength in the face of a really increasingly uncertain and scary future. And so that's what success looks like to me is that when you go to school, you feel protected, you feel safe, you feel empowered to take on what's scary beyond the walls of your school building. Excellent. Well, can you all please join me in thanking Nana, Maya, and Kira? <laughs>